Good afternoon, everyone. I can't tell you just how honored I am to have been asked to speak here today. It's a very, very great privilege. But I must say that uh, following Jim Nance isn't my idea of a fair shake. <laughs> the, uh, the qualities of Arnold Palmer's character and his magnetic personality, which were so appealing in America, also endeared him to golf fans and sports fans, and indeed the wider public all around the world. Arnie's army was global, and affection for him was truly international. He was simply adored by millions. Early in Arnold's career, his father, Deacon, told his son that if he wanted to be remembered as a great golfer, he would have to play and win outside the United States, as well as at home. Arnold clearly heeded this excellent advice. Partnered in the United States team, initially by Sam Sneed and then by Jack Nicklaus, he won Canada Cups and World Cups in Ireland, in France, in Japan, in Mexico, as well as in Hawaii. He won the Australian and Canadian Opens, the Spanish Open, the Longcom Trophy in Paris, and two world match play titles at Wentworth in England. He played on six winning Ryder Cup teams, and three of those matches were staged in the UK. I know that his success at the age of 45 in the PGA Championship particularly pleased him. At the prize giving, wearing his mischievous smile, he said he'd been trying for years to win a PGA Championship, and where better to do it than Royal St. George's? No help to his major record, it was in fact the British version. After his playing years, Arnold's extensive business interests and his close association with Mark McCormack ensured that he retained his international focus. The growth of the Palmer brand is a story in its own right, but its foundations lie in the character and the values of the man himself. I think though it was Arnold's uh, performances at the Open Championship which first really brought him to the attention of the overseas audience. In 1960, in its centenary year, the championship was to be staged at the old course at St Andrews, and there was a tremendous buzz of, anticipa of anticipation. Arnold Palmer was coming to play. That year, Arnold had already won the Masters and the US Open. Could he possibly make it three majors in a row? Well, it wasn't to be. Arnold put up a great fight, but came in second by a single stroke to the late Kel Nagel from Australia. He must have been bitterly disappointed, but as you would, have expect, as you would expect of the man, he accepted it with the greatest dignity. Undeterred, Arnold returned to the championship the following year and won in simply atrocious weather at Royal Birkdale. He often said his second round was the very best of his career, and that was a 73. He retained the claret jug in 62 at Troon, with the finest golf many said they had ever seen, taming the fearsome 11th hole in each round with long iron play of simply astonishing quality. Now, amazingly in those days, every competitor in the Open had to play in the qualifying rounds to secure his place in the championship proper. And that even applied to the defending champion. Arnold clearly didn't think too much of this and explained to the RNA in no uncertain terms that this practice had better be changed or they might face something of a shortage of past champion entries in the future. Now, not always quick on the uptake or renowned for its speedy responses, the RNA immediately introduced an exemption system for the following year in 1963. <laughs> they knew the way where the wind was blowing. The RNA in the open owe Arnold a very great debt. In those difficult post-war years prior to 1960, very few American golfers played in the championship. 
and in those 15 Opens, there were only two American winners. Arnold's success in the early 60s inspired many more of his countrymen to make the trip to, golf, to golf's oldest major. And in the following 15 Opens, American players won on nine occasions. The Open had been revitalized and was firmly back on the road to the great event it is today. Despite his disappointment in 1960, Arnold loved St Andrews and always enjoyed his visits to the home of golf. He became an honorary member of the Royal and Ancient Golf Club in 1979, and I particularly remember one of his fairly recent visits about seven years ago when he played in the Spring Medal. The weather was simply awful. 45 mile an hour wind, very cold, horizontal rain, and our Arnold's group decided to call it a day after six holes. When Arnold got back to the clubhouse, he was literally blue with cold. And I suggested that we might repair to the trophy room where we introduced Arnold to the miraculous inner warming and restorative properties of Whiskey Mac. For those of you not familiar with this cocktail, it's a very strong mixture of scotch and ginger wine. Arnold clearly took quite a liking to Whiskey Mac, <laughs> as after several further iterations, the group got around to discussing the possibility of increasing the drink's popularity by renaming it after the great man. At this point, Alistair Johnston, Arnold's long-term business manager, who'd been sitting quietly in the corner, rather spoilt the party by reminding us all that the name Arnold Palmer was already spoken for in the beverage sector. <laughs> Arnold simply raised his eyes toward the ceiling. Gladly, Arnold made further visits to St Andrews, and in 2010, he was awarded the honorary degree of Doctor of Laws by St Andrews University. Most recently, though, he attended the Champions Dinner last year at the 2015 Open and played in the four-hole past champions challenge. It was a great occasion, a beautiful summer's evening, huge crowds lining the first, second, 17th and 18th fairways of the old course. We had 28 champions competing in teams of four. And needless to say, Arnold received the loudest and the most rapturous reception. A measure, I think, of how his popularity had not waned one bit but it actually grown as the years had passed. And you can guess whose team won the challenge. They really did. Arnold was interviewed that evening beside the 18th green and commenting on the wonderful reception he'd received from the tens of thousands of fans. He said to the journalist in a rather surprised voice, you know, I think they all remember. Well, how could they ever forget? Arnold recently demonstrated his unfailing commitment to our sport through his strong support of golf's return to the Olympic Games. He understood just how positive this would be for the smaller golfing nations, and he felt a duty to speak out to help grow the game that had given him so much. Yes, Arnold was golf's greatest ambassador, both at home and abroad. He mixed with heads of state, with presidents, with prime ministers, but he never lost his common touch. He could open doors which were firmly closed to others and spread interest in golf far and wide. But we all know he was more than an ambassador. He was the king and always will be. Have there been better golfers? Well, perhaps, but only a very few. Has anyone done more for our game? No one has come even close. Has there been a finer human being? Well, I admit I haven't met one yet. Arnold, we wish you Godspeed and thank you from golfers the world over for all you have done. Yours was indeed a life well played.
Okay. Uh, doesn't fit. <laughs> doesn't. Mm. Oh well. There have been a few times in my life where standing behind a podium just felt a little different. A bit more meaningful, more memorable, and because of that, perhaps more difficult in both my head and my heart. One of those moments came four years ago last month when I was honored and humbled to be asked to speak on behalf of Arnold Palmer as he received the Congressional Gold Medal. It was a day to celebrate everything, has, everything Arnold has meant to golf in our country. The other opportunity is today, an occasion when I'm again honored and humbled to help you celebrate everything Arnold has meant to golf in our country, but also to our hearts, and most difficult for me to celebrate what he has meant to my life. In many ways, the easiest and most difficult speeches are when you're talking about something that means so much to you. Arnold Palmer meant the world to you, the game of golf, his countless fans, and my wife Barbara and me. Because of this, this is not one of the easiest speeches, so you don't mind if I read a little bit here. And if you forgive me, I would like to borrow a little from September 2012 when I stood before Congress to thank him for honoring my rival and my friend, Arnold Palmer. Before I do, I must mention one thing about that day. As you might expect, there was a parade of politicians who spoke with whereas this and whereas that. Some beautiful, wonderful things were said about Arnold. But I noticed the entire time that Arnold was rather stoic and showed little emotion. So I started to wonder about something. Most of you all know that Arnold is a bit of hard, hard of hearing. So after the ceremony, I got to the elevator Arn, with Arnold and I said, tell me something, AP. How much of that ceremony did you hear? Zero. <laughs> so I started laughing and said, well, you might want to get a video because some really nice things were said about you. <laughs> when, I, when I spoke that day, I kidded that when you get to be our age, you meet a lot of people who begin conversations with, I remember when. It's not uncommon for a new friend to walk up and say, I remember when I saw you at the 1962 U.S. Open at Oakmont, I was standing behind the 17th green and was wearing a yellow shirt. You waved and winked at me, remember? <laughs> of course, there's only one response to that. How could I ever forget? As I said then, and I repeat with a heavy heart today, in parts of seven decades, I knew Arnold Palmer. There were countless and sometimes comical I remember wins. And most important, even more, cher more cherished members, cherished moments I will never forget. There will and remain the moments that provide us a glimpse into the golfer who epitomized charisma, the man whose character, loyalties, and loves were unshakable, the caring, giving gentleman we celebrate today. He was an everyday man, everybody, everyone's hero. Aunt Arnold managed to remove the eye from icon and instead let, instead let the world share in his greatness. Over the last week or so, I have shared so many stories with people about my dear friend Arnold Palmer. At least to me, these stories that illustrate that Arnold Palmer is the Arnold Palmer I will never forget, and I hope never forget. I hope you never forget. I remember when I first saw Arnold hit a golf ball. I was 14 years old, playing in the highest state amateur at Sylvania Country Club in Toledo. I was on the golf course. It had been pouring down rain all day. And I came in off the golf course. I was the only one on the golf course. I walked by the practice range. There was only one person on the practice range. And I stopped, and I looked at him, 
looked like Popeye. He was hitting these short irons, but he was drilling them about eight feet high. And they looked like they just just running right through the, through, through the rain. Uh, and I sat there and looked at it, and I watched him for about 30 minutes. And I never, I didn't know him, he didn't know me. I walked into the clubhouse, and I said, who in the world is that guy on the practice tee out there hitting balls like Popeye? He said, oh, that's our defending champion, Arnold Palmer. Well, that's an Arnold Palmer I will never forget. I remember, I remember when four years later, at the age of 18, I played up with Arnold for the first time. It was Dal Finsterwald Day. Dal had won the PGA Championship to celebrate his victory. They held a four-man exhibition in Athens Country Club in southeastern Ohio. And we had a driving contest on the first tee. First hole was four, 330 yards long, obviously a par four. Arnold drove the ball on the green. I drove the ball over the green and won the driving contest. I shot 68 that day. But of course, Arnold went out and made eight birdies and an eagle and shot a course record 62. For years, I pointed out to Arnold that I had outdrove him. And he quickly reminded me he shot the lowest score. So if you ever want, wanted to know the genesis of our friendly rivalry, it was when I was 18 years old. The date, September 25th, 1958. And the, and the competitiveness between us never ended, be it ironic, fitting, or something spiritual to me, that very day exactly 58 years ago. But with passion that came with Arnold's game and our competition, I quickly saw the compassion that would always underlie it. When I'm, I remember when we played our first PGA Tour event together. It was early 1962. I was a 22-year-old rookie, and we were playing the final round of the Phoenix Open. Arnold and I obviously were paired together. We got around to the 17th green, and Arnold came over and put his, well, walked as we walked off the 17th, he put his arm on my shoulder. He, I knew, and he knew, that I needed a birdie to finish second. By the way, Arnold only nipped me there by 12 shots that week. Arnold said, just relax. It's not a hard par five. You're in good shape. Just play smart, and you'll finish second. He didn't have to do that. It was Arnold Palmer. Yet here was Arnold trying to help a young guy while winning a tournament. That's an Arnold Palmer I'll never forget. Uh, I remember when I won my first professional tournament and my first major 54 years ago this summer, 1962 at Oakmont. I was a 22-year-old with blinders on having no clue that I was not only battling the great Arnold Palmer, but doing so in his Pennsylvania backyard at Oakmont. Yet I remember we were about to tee off at an 18-0 playoff. Arnold walked over to me, and uh, in those days, it was customary for uh, when we played a playoff on the extra day that you split the, uh, or, or, you, or the winner won the, uh, uh, the, the gate for the last day on the, on the playoff. And Arnold walked over to me and he said, you know, would you like to split the gate today? And I said, well, you know, I said, I, I sort of felt like, well, you know, why would he want to do that? I mean, he's going to win it anyway. And it, was, it turned out it was $1,400. That was the gate. But uh, I said to him, I said, now, let's just play for it. I guess I, I want it. It seemed to me like a king's ransom then. Anyway, here I was, a winless rookie with a nine-month-old baby, about to play the most important playoff of my life, and Arnold Palmer was thinking to me, by the way, it turned out to be a kind offer, and eventually, because I said I eventually pocketed the whole gate. But still, that's an Arnold Palmer I'll never forget. Mark McCormick managed Arnold and me, as well as our dear friend Gary Player, and because of that, we were put together in matches and big three exhibitions all over the world. We played together, we traveled together, we laughed a lot. Our wives became the absolute closest of friends, as did we. I've said a lot this week about Arnold's had two loves, golf and flying. And of course, Russ did a beautiful job cap capturing Arnold's passion for, for planes and flying. In some ways, Arnold approached his golf much like 
flying. He was passionate, loved to go fast, and he had a fearlessness about him. I remember a day in, in the 1960s, Arnold and I went out to Seagraves, Texas, a little town in West Texas, to play an exhibition. He had picked me up at his Aero Commander, and it was one of those windswept days in West Texas. And the Aero Commander were just bouncing all over the, all over the sky. To me, I felt like a, you know, a piece of paper in a tornado, and I'm holding on for dear life, scared to death. In fact, it's like a roller coaster coming off the tracks. I looked over at Arnold, and he was laughing. And it was like he was sitting in the front seat of a roller coaster, enjoying every moment. I did not enjoy that flight. <laughs> and with his other love, golf, I'm still not sure who needed, needed the other the most. So let's just call it a love affair to last a lifetime. The game gave so much to Arnold, but he gave back so much more. Arnold came along when golf needed him most. When TV first embraced the sport of golf, they had a swashbuckling, swashbuckling hero in Arnold as the game's face. Just like the young man I watched that day in 1954, muscles taut, piercing rain drops with every shot, Arnold Palmer was the everyday man's hero. He embodied the hardworking strength of America with his shirt often hanging out, a hitch in his pants, and Arnold played a game we could all appreciate. He made the recovery shot a form of art, and people adored it. At times, he played like no one else before or after him, and at times, he played like everyone else who had ever gripped a club, and that endeared him to all, watching outside the ropes or from their living room. He appealed to everyone. When he slipped on a green jacket, you might say he was comfortable wearing a blue collar or white collar beneath it. He had a swagger long before it was cool, but his charisma came with a softness, a smile, and a wink, and as everybody has said today, a trademark thumbs up. We competed in everything from majors to endorsements to golf course design to a game of bridge at 40,000 feet. You name it. We likely competed for it, and I promise you, if there was ever a problem, I knew Arnold had my back, and he knew I had his. I've said before, and I can't emphasize it enough today, I may have had to battle Arnold's army early on, but I never had to battle Arnold Palmer. Today, I'm a proud soldier in Arnie's army. You see, I've even got an umbrella on my lapel. He was the king of our sport, and he always will be. Like the great Vin Scully, when he called his last game Sunday night for the Dodgers, he says, don't be sad that it's over. Smile because it happened. Today I hurt just like you hurt. You don't lose a friend of almost 60 years and not feel an enormous loss. But my wife often says that memories are the cushions of life. <clears throat> Each of you sitting here today, or perhaps sitting at home, has at least one wonderful memory of Arnold Palmer to balance out your hurting heart. So for today, so today and many years from now, I simply ask, I simply ask you to just remember when. To his dear wife, Kit, his adored daughters, Peg and Amy, their families, Kit's, Kit, Kit's children, his friends, and his millions of fans, Remember when Arnold Palmer touched your life, touched your heart. And please, don't forget why. Thank you. Thank you.